all other books that you ever read about their lives are just figment, figment of a human imagination. But only the author or the person can tell you about their own lives. Right? So I'm going to share with you candidly. Is it okay, everybody? I'm sure you want to hear that, right? About their own lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly of their lives. You know, what? This is one thing I have understood, I have come to learn about the saints. Even if you look at the Bible, God does not hide anything. The good, the bad and the ugly of every hero in the Bible is written very candidly. Right? King David, who is called the man after God's own heart, even his ugly secrets are written in the scriptures. Abraham, the great father of faith. Even his ugly secret is written in the Bible. Right? And the prophet Elijah, great prophet who called on fire from heaven. His ugly secret is written in the Bible. So God does not hide anything. And they are written not to shame them, but to show to us that the excellency of the power of God Rests in an earthen vessel so that the earthen vessel need not be deified or glorified, but the excellency is of God. Amen. So it is also written that to show, if with all their weaknesses, that they can become special to God, so can you. Amen. That's why it is written there. So that when we look at ourselves and we see our own ugliness and we feel that we can't measure up to that goodness, then suddenly God shows you, look, Abraham lied. Why did he lie? He was afraid of his own life more than protecting his wife. What sort of a husband is that? <laughs> you tell me. You know, this morning, you heard a wonderful message by Pastor Joe Sweet. And look at how a glowing tribute he paid for his dear wife. How appreciative he was of her and how great tribute he paid for her. That's a good husband. But look at Abraham. <laughs> he couldn't care less about his wife. He didn't care if she slept with another woman, with another man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is not wrong in America, you know. In America, they do that, right? So I'm sorry, it's just a slip of tongue. He couldn't care less if she slept with another man. What he cared was his own life. Right? Am I right? So you see that in the Bible. So if with all that weakness, he can still be called a friend of God, so can you. Amen. Amen. So can you. A man like King David, who fought great wars for God, if he can scheme to kill an innocent man, and the blood is all on his hands, and still, he's called a man after my own heart. If he can, so can you. Amen. If a great prophet like Elijah, who single-handedly killed 850 false prophets and turned a whole nation back to God, such a great man, she chicken out <laughs> and ran for his dear life by the word of a mere woman. I always wonder, no? How, why did he do that? If he can run for his life for fear and yet God translated him without tasting death, so can you. 
Amen. All these are written for our example. If God can be good to them, if He can be gracious to them, if He can be merciful to them, many more times He will be good to you, gracious to you, merciful to you because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. If we can do all that to them under the old covenant, how much more he will do for you under the new covenant because of the blood of Jesus Christ that is always pleading for you before the throne of God. How much more? So the more God will do for you. So, who is Miriam? What is she like? She was a very devout woman. And she always sought God with all her heart. And she waited on God. Because she learned that from her brother, Moses. All the times that he was called to wait on God. For 40 days and 40 nights. Two times. And... Not counting the other times where he spent hours from the very early morning, about 2 or 3 in the morning, and right before daybreak, he will just wait in the holy presence of God. So Miriam learned from her brother how to wait on God, and she used to practice waiting on God. That is why the grace of God came upon her and used her as a prophetess. Now, when Moses was born, the Bible tells us that there was a danger for the lives of all Hebrew babies, especially male babies that were born. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 22 tells us that the Pharaoh had given order to all the midwives that when they see a son born, she should squeeze or turn the neck and break the neck and kill the baby and then throw it into the Nile River to be fed as food to the Nile gods, which is a crocodile. So that was what they were commanded. But these Hebrew midwives save all the babies. You know the rest of the story, right? So when there was some danger, so baby Moses was safe and the mother kept him hidden, but the baby kept on growing. They don't stay small all the time, right? You know, I have uh, two of our partners in the U.S., among, among the many partners. One lives in Colorado and the other lives in Pennsylvania. And these two families have adorable children the one in Colorado has three adorable girls cute little girls you know when children are very small they are very cherubic right so these three girls extremely cute extremely beautiful then the family in Pennsylvania they have two girls and one boy gorgeous looking children and each time they see me in a conference, you know, they come running and five feet away from me, they jump up <laughs> and they lunge and grab me. You know, I feel the impact on my chest. <laughs> and then they grab my neck and kiss me on my cheek, say, oh, we love you. And I feel the pain of my chest. <laughs> That's how they do every time, you know. So, the youngest, youngest in the two families is a girl in the Colorado Springs and a boy in Pennsylvania. So I always tell them, listen, don't grow. <laughs> always remain this small. The following year when I see them, they grow one feet taller. So I tell them, why did you grow? <laughs> Remember what I told you. And now, 
the girl in Colorado is taller than me because her parents are very tall. And the little boy, he's up to my height. So I just met them recently. I said, why did you grow? Look at you, now I have to look up. You can't keep them small, can you? No. In the same way, Moses' mother cannot keep him small. He was growing. And not only he was growing, he was making a lot of noise. So they cannot keep him hidden anymore. So for the safety of the boy, the mother decided to take a big risk. She made a little ark of bulrushes, put the boy in the ark and set him down in the Nile River. Did she ever consider about those crocodiles in the Nile River? You know, whenever I read the passage, I used to think, okay, she tried to save him from the sword of the Pharaoh's army, but did she consider the risk she was taking of putting the boy in the river where he could be eaten up by the crocodiles? But the mother had a backup plan. She wise mother. She put the ark on the river and then she told her oldest daughter, Miriam. She told her, keep an eye on your brother. So which meant, if any crocodile came, Miriam was to fight off those crocodiles. <laughs> Right? Right. <laughs> you read that in... No, you don't read all these things. These are all my version of the story. Okay. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, we read that Miriam walked along the banks of the river and kept an eye on the ark so that it does not capsize or no harm comes to it no other entity comes to do any harm to her baby brother. And she made sure no danger came. Likewise, there is a danger that is going to come to the lives of little children in these last days. You know, I'll tell you one thing. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 says, and in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall see visions. You know the word sons and daughters in the original Hebrew language meant little children. Within the age of 5 to 12, that's what the word sons and daughters meant. So when little children... 12 years old and below, they are going to see visions and prophesy. That is their destiny. And Psalms 8 2 says, Suckling babies and toddlers, which means from the age of zero right up to two, the Lord is going to anoint those babies and put a new song a new anointing of praise into their lips so that these little babies are going to cast out demons. Yeah. You know, several years ago, we were conducting a fasting prayer meeting in Chennai, our hometown. We have a meeting once a month. And one day, as I was waiting while the worship was going on, an angel appeared before me. And he had a scroll in his hand. He unfolded the scroll and he began to read from the scroll. And he said, The time has now come for Psalms 8 2 to be fulfilled. And he began to read, saying, The little sons, the little daughters, the suckling babies, and the thoughtless, they are going to cast out demons. So God wants you to train, to develop special TV programs that will train these little children for their destiny. So I, when my turn came to preach, I related to the, all the people this vision that I just saw and this new command that the Lord gave me and what we are going to do. 
So there was a family among the 2,000 who come, one family with a newborn baby, boy, and an eight-year-old daughter. They came from the neighboring city. She hurt and uh, understood it, went back home. Six months later, a tragedy or a danger came to this family. They had a servant girl, a 13-year-old servant girl, who was a distant relative of them, who was demon-possessed. Now, nobody knew that this little girl was demon-possessed. Every night, when the whole family has gone to sleep, the woman up in her bedroom could hear the sound of pots clashing and things being thrown up and down and everything turning topsy-turvy and she thought maybe it's a cat you know in India the cats they have a wild time <laughs> when everybody goes to sleep do the cats in the US do that? no oh yes some yes some no okay those who say yes your cats are from India. <laughs> so anyway, so each morning when the woman comes to the kitchen, she'll see everything topsy-turvy upside down. And she thought, must be those cats. So she would put her kitchen back in order, and this was repeated every day. So she wondered, which cat is this cat that is coming and having a wild party in her house. So she made sure she really bolted all her windows and the doors so that no cat can come in. And even though the same thing was repeated again and again, one day she decided to catch the cat red-handed. So when she heard the noises, she came down and she was shocked of her life to see a 13-year-old relative in a very hysterical, demonic look, throwing all the pots and pans everywhere, and then turn around and look at her boss with a kitchen knife in her hand, about to stab her. And she was so scared, she stepped back, not knowing what to do. She can't chase away the girl because it's a relative, you know? So she didn't know what to do. You know, after you know that there is a knife-wielding, demon-possessed person in your family, do you think you can sleep peacefully ever after that? <laughs> One way to keep you praying all night. <laughs> so she couldn't sleep at all anymore. Then, one fine day, one morning, she came down to make milk for her son. Now, by now, this boy is 18 months old. So she carried her son and she came down to the kitchen. And just about that time, the servant girl came out of the kitchen with a bottle of milk for the boy. And this boy looked at the girl, stretched out his hand, and he just smiled. At the moment he smiled, now this is the testimony of the mother, with her own naked eyes she saw a dark, shadowy, evil spirit depart from the girl and go out of their house. When she saw that, she looked at her son, he just was waving his hand and still smiling. She, she was looking at the two. He waved his hand and the demon left. As she was looking at that, suddenly she remembered what I preached a year ago, that the suckling babies and the toddlers will cast out demons. And that came to pass. See, this is the destiny for the little babies, for the toddlers and for the children. That is their destiny. However, now the devil has an assignment to take them out. Just like how the, all the male babies at Moses' time were taken out, 
and all the male babies or toddlers during the Lord Jesus time were taken out how do we know that turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12 and let's look at verse 2 and verse 4 then being with child she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth and verse 4 says his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born so I want you to imagine the scenario like this here you see a woman in labor and the dragon comes and stands just looking at her womb for the moment of birth and as soon as the baby was to be born the devil will just pluck out the baby and kill you know many years ago a friend of mine a Muslim man whenever his wife conceives that night she has a dream in the dream a witch will come to a house and the witch will sit or stand by her bedroom and just stare at her womb just stare at a womb for a long time and then the witch will go away the following day she will have a miscarriage this happened every time this woman will conceive every time she conceives the witch will come and just stare at her womb and then curse she's cursing and the following day she suffers a miscarriage so one day my friend a very very close friend like a bosom buddy so he told me he told me the problem he said you know you have cast out so many demons can you please pray for us and ask your God what is your problem so I fasted for three days in their house and I prayed and asked the Lord what was the problem then the Lord showed me that there was a witchcraft assignment put on the wife's life so that she cannot conceive and that's the witch that comes that's the curse that's put on her so that it's curse and she cannot conceive so after prayer I broke everything off and she was set free so when I whenever I read the scripture I used to remember that incident that my friend's wife encountered so here you read that in the last days now the whole book of Revelation is about the future it's never about the past right everybody agrees you know chapter 12 many theologians explain that to mean that the woman was Israel and the child was Jesus and um, the one third of the stars that fell are the one third of the angels have you heard like that okay so once I had a debate with a theologian see I'm not a theologian no I don't I don't have any ABCDs after my name what else they have all the strings of titles so this theologian is a very good friend so he has a double doctorate degree and he is a master of Greek and Hebrew and he knows the Bible like the back of his hand when he preaches he doesn't even open the scriptures and he can quote from Genesis to Revelation very very learned wonderful man of God spiritual man of God humble man of God but theologian You know, no matter how good they are, at the end of the day, they are a theologian. So they'll always come back to the theology of everything. So we were having a cup of tea, and I, we talked about the book of Revelation, and I asked him a question. I said, my dear brother, tell me this. Is this, what does this portion, chapter 12, talks about? And he gave me a theolo theological answer, which I, just, which I just told you. And then I asked him a question. This book of Revelation, is it about the future or about the past? 
It's about the future. If the book of Revelation is about the future, then how is it that only chapter 12 can be about the past? If everything's about the future, how can only one chapter be about the past? Does it make any sense? No. But see, you are so smart to answer this question, but that theologian was not. He just looked at me. The theologians do that, no? They give that wise look. But that wise look means they are trying hard to find an answer. <laughs> but that, that uh, brother is a very humble man. So he asked me, what is the answer then? I said, the answer is very simple, Pastor. It's all about the future. So, which meant, the child is not Jesus, but the child is a representative of the last day's remnant company that will be born, that will rise up. And the one third of the stars are not the angels that fell with Lucifer, but those highly anointed men and women of God who are shining like stars for the work of the Lord. They will fall. They will fall. The Lord Jesus himself said, if possible, the very elect can be deceived. So the stars are those elect. So they can fall. If the elect can fall, what about you and me? What chance do we have? Right? If they who walk with God, shining like stars, if they can fall, what about you and me? What chance is there? So, there is a danger that is coming in these last days for the lives of children. That is why, you know, God is going to open the spiritual eyes of the children. He's going to open their ears. They are going to see visions. They are going to prophesy. This is their destiny. Now, here comes the counterfeit of the devil through Harry Potter. Now, what is Harry Potter? Magic and mystery, right? He does wonders, magic with a wand in his hand. That is, on the opposite side is, miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right? See, that's the counterfeit. To take away the minds of your children from their God-given prophetic destiny into the anointing of the devil. This is to devour them, kill them from their destiny. Now, what is your responsibility? Those who have the anointing of Deborah, of Miriam, you are supposed to carefully guard them in prayer. As Miriam guarded the bush, the ark, from being swallowed in the same manner the woman who have the call and the mantle of Miriam your first responsibility is to carefully guard the children in prayer so you have to pray for them watch over them protect them from the evil that is in the society thirdly she volunteered to call for a nursing mother to care for the new baby. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, we read, when Pharaoh's daughter finds the baby, she was so excited because she was married and she could not conceive for a long, long time. She was like barren for life. Now suddenly, she finds a God, the Nile God given child. So that's what she thought. The Nile God had answered her prayer and given her child. But being a barren woman, she could not nurse the baby. So as she was thinking what to do, suddenly appeared Miriam. And she volunteered 
and she said would you like for me to find a nursing mother who has milk who can feed the baby and uh, Pharaoh's daughter was so glad and she assigned Miriam to go and look for a woman who is motherly enough to nurse this baby and Miriam ran and brought the mother's original the baby's original mother and said this is the woman I have found <laughs> and little did Pharaoh's daughter knew that's the original mother so what does this tell us bringing someone to the Lord Jesus Andrew brought Peter to the Lord Jesus John chapter 1 verse 40 to 42 and we read Philip brought Nathaniel to the Lord Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 45 and in John chapter 6 verse 12 verses 2 to 13 we read that Andrew brought a little lad little boy to the Lord Jesus and through that a multitude was fed so what does this tell us the last days Miriam anointed woman will guide the last days children and youths to a good church to grow in the spirit and in wisdom so your job is to guide them guide them to a good place not all are good right we have the good the bad and the ugly unfortunately we have the wise virgin in the church and the foolish virgins among the many churches there are wise churches and foolish churches and among the many churches there are churches that are like wheat and there are some like tares right so your job is to lead the last day's generation to a right place let me give you one example this I share with sadness you know in our TV programs say I'm I don't have a call to pastor a church neither to start any churches that's never my call and uh, so in our TV programs after the messages when I give an altar call at the end of the program I always tell my viewers those who accepted the Lord as their personal savior please go to a good church near your home and tell the pastor what God has done to you through this program and those pastors can establish you and grow you so quite recently I received a testimony like this this woman came to our monthly fasting prayer meeting and shared this testimony and this woman is from a very very orthodox Hindu family called the Brahmins they are very orthodox and she watched our evangelistic program and she got saved she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ she has never been to any church she does not know anything about Christianity all the information she got about Christianity was watching Angel TV that's all she was watching it day and night every day and one fine day she got saved so she heard me say go to a good church near your home so the following uh, day she or the following Sunday she decided to go and look for a good church near home and she found a church near home so she entered into the church and the service has already started and she sat in the church she was waiting for an opportunity to go up to the pastor and introduce herself as what I have said so that she can be planted in the church and then grow as a Christian and the pastor came on the, onto the pulpit when he started preaching he preached a message of brimstone and hellfire against me he was fuming down fire fuming that he was speaking everything bad about me and he was telling all his church members don't watch angel tv it's a tool of the devil this woman newly saved woman she was shocked hearing all that and she testified how can this be a tool of the devil 
when it had brought me to the foot of the cross. She was so disgusted with the pastor, she left the church. And she came and asked me a question. You told me to go to a good church. So now you show me where's the good church. <laughs> so, the number two responsibility that the Miriam anointed woman have is to guide the last day's children and the youths. See, there's a great harvest going to come. Right? Children are going to get safe. Youths are going to get safe. It is your responsibility to guide them into a good place like Miriam guided her brother. Number four. Miriam, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 15 verse 20 was a prophetess. Now being a prophetess, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 12 verses 2 to 6 that God spoke to her and through her. That's what a prophetess is or a prophet is. God speaks to you and God speaks through you. Through the gift of prophecy, you hear a word and then you give a word. But at the same time, a prophet or a prophetess cannot become a soothsayer. See, that is the danger. Should never, never treat the gift of prophecy or the office of a prophet to be a medium, to be a soothsayer, you know, to give out words to everybody. That is wrong. Because in the new covenant, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 15 says, all those who are called as sons and daughters, the Lord will lead them and he will guide them. He will speak to you directly. So when God is going to speak to you directly, so why do you need to go to these sources for? So, if you don't need to go to these sources and God can speak to you directly, why do we need prophets for? That's the other question. You know, God has prophets in the, in the church not to establish any new doctrine. Because whatever we have in the Bible is all sufficient for our salvation, our redemption, our justification, our sanctification is completed. Nothing more can be added. Whatever new revelation that supposedly God gives you is nothing but an elaboration of what is already revealed in the scriptures. You know, there are many times that I've had some wonderful visitations from God, wonderful revelations which I have thought in the past, oh, this is, where is it in the Bible? And when I look through the Bible, I can't find anything. So I thought to myself, I was somebody special who received something great, extraordinary, out of the world revelation. But, as I grew older, I realized all those new revelations are nothing new, but just an amplification of what is already revealed in the word. Everything is already there. It's just amplified for our finite mind to understand. Now, so what is the role of a prophet in these last days? One, See, the scriptures, the many prophecies in the Bible do not have a timeline. They don't tell you exactly what happens when. The prophecies are there. But the prophets in these last days, God uses them to tell us when a particular prophecy is going to come to pass. For example, on the 1st of January, as I was with no need to go first of January. Last year, about the birth of this conference, when we were on a 40-day fast, and an angelic being came to me and said, now the time has come for Psalm 68, 11 to be fulfilled. So now I hear the word, and I prophesy the word. Now the time has come. 
And yesterday you heard very wonderfully and very powerfully from Lou Ingle how he himself had that word and he felt or received the confirmation in this meeting. See, and how, where was it born? It was born in a visitation. And this year, on January 1st, the Lord told me, now that time has come for Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 to be fulfilled. So, when I heard that, I shivered because I know what is that scripture. I know that by heart. That is the breaking of the fifth seal. And when the fifth seal is broken, martyrs are seen. And the Lord told me, I want you to organize a conference for martyrs. Such a thing has never been done in the world. Say, I want you to organize a conference for martyrs and I will gather those who are called to be martyrs to the conference. And I will speak to them directly and they will receive their marching orders. So we are going to hold the conference next week. As soon as I return back home to India, just two days later, we have the conference for martyrs from May 4, 5, 6. See, that is what a prophet in these last days do. They show us the timelines of the prophecies when they are going to be fulfilled. In which part of the time are we standing now? What should we do with the counsel of God? That is the role of a prophet. And of course, they give some directions what we should do or what seasons we are entering into and then knowing that then we sit down and get the nitty gritty details from God which God will speak to you directly not all will be revealed through a prophet the main outline will be spoken through a prophet then when you sit down and you pray then God speaks to you all the nitty gritty things what you should do how you should do how you should accomplish every details will be given to you so Miriam was a prophetess and God spoke to her and through her and the next thing about a, Miriam being a prophetess was Numbers chapter 12 verse 6 tells us that she saw visions and dreams so God spoke to her through visions and dreams and God appeared to her many times in dreams and even before she, Moses came to Egypt God appeared in her dream and called her to help a brother Moses and Aaron had a similar visitation from God like that so God told him your brother Moses will come back and you are supposed to help him so that is why when Moses returned back to Egypt his, his first strength those who recognize his call was his own family is the family the older brother older sister they stood on the right and on the left of Moses and they strengthened him they worship for him because Moses was an, a stranger to the rest of Israel they stood by they saying this is our brother and God has called him so that was like a confirmation to the call so this also tells us another thing family team ministry see family ministry husband and wife father mother children siblings together family ministry she was given the gift of dreams visions and prophecy and she used to prophesy to all the people in Israel and Exodus chapter 18 verses 13 to 26 tells us that she was one of the judges appointed by Moses to judge Israel and many times God will speak to her of dangers that are going to befall to Israel or that is coming ahead of Israel and she would then go and inform or convey that to Moses 
who will then act upon it see this is something we can learn from the life of miriam one of the very common mistake intercessors make and all those people good people who have prophetic gifts the mistake they make is in their zeal of having received a revelation they would impose on the pastor to act upon what they saw that they were kind of even force the pastor or insist on the pastor to do exactly as what they have seen as a result many good meaning pastors have shunned away from the prophetic gifts because of this what they see the jezebelic kind of a control that comes from good meaningful people you are not a jezebel that's a wrong assumption but your works your mannerisms made them think that you don't have a good prophetic gift but a jezebelic operation so the mistake is on both sides now you don't want to do that we learn we from her life that whenever she sees a vision though she was a prophetess because moses is the god chosen leader for the whole of israel should go and convey to her brother my little brother this is what i saw and then moses takes it and then he acts upon it so this is one thing that she did and she would interpret dreams for people because of her gifting so now with all this what should the last days woman do the last days miriam anointed woman they will all rise up as prophetess and being a prophetess god will speak to you through visions and through dreams in joel chapter 2 verse 28 promises us that in the last days god will pour out his spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters so there is a woman there a little woman and your youth so youth also mean young girls youth girls so there is a woman there and your old men and your old women see there is a woman there so which means all age group from a toddler right up to an old woman everyone in the last days will be prophetically anointed amen you will see visions you will hear the voice of god god will speak to you and you will dream dreams of god this is your destiny number 5 miriam was a prophetic worshipper this is one thing we see about her life in exodus chapter 15 verse 20 now turn your bible with me to exodus 15 20 then miriam the prophetess the sister of aaron took the timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancers and miriam answered them sing to the lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea it's 9:25 right now time for me to stop i have a great reputation in this church <laughs> to be a very long winded speaker is it okay yes. you don't want me to stop and continue tomorrow no, no? are you sure yes. you will stay as long as i finish yes really yes. oh you precious woman <laughs> so miriam was a prophetic worshipper and she thought the other woman how to praise and worship god we read that in exodus 15:21 now this is something some background about her life angels used to visit her in the nights 
and give us songs to sing. And she taught the other woman how to praise Yahweh God because she herself was a worshipper. And even in the wee hours of the night, she would sing unto God. She would sing to God and people all around the tents in Israel could hear her singing praises to God in the, even in the middle of the night. Now, what do we learn from here? Now, I want you to look at one very important scripture. Now, please look at your Bible. Exodus 15, 21. In 1521, and Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord. Now please underline that phrase. Sing to the Lord. There is a proper method to sing war songs. A proper way, a proper method to sing war songs. This we see in the life of the prophet Moses in Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 to 19 where it says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. So it was Moses who began to sing a song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. This was a song Moses sang after they had crossed the Red Sea. Now I would like you to look at the scripture again closely. Exodus 15 verse 1. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Now please underline that. Sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord. Now underline, sing to the Lord. Now let's pause there and look at one more scripture. In Exodus 15, 21, that which we saw earlier, it says, and Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord. Now you already underlined that, right? Now three times, you see the same phrase repeated again and again. And they sang to the Lord and sing to the Lord. They did not sing to themselves. Like the many songs that we sing today. Most of the songs that we sing today are make me feel good songs. Right? Make me feel good. I am this, I am that. When you're happy and you know, clap your hands. Uh, that's not a Christian song, right? Okay. Sorry. I, I... But we have something like that. Right? When you're happy and you know, clap your hands. Right? We have songs like that. I will sing like David sing. Or dance like David dance. Do you know that song? Now, is there any praise or worship in that song? If you are going to sing like David sing or dance like David dance, what praise is that to God in that song? What glory is that to God in that song? There's no praise, no majesty, no glory to God in songs like this. But it is this kind of songs that we sing in our church services. And then we sing. And then we say, oh, I feel goosebumps. Those are not goosebumps, but mosquito bites. <laughs> you know, we have been putting before God our stinking flesh as an offering, the smell of the sweat of our body before God more than a sweet aroma before God. That is why 
we don't see any manifestation of the glory of God in our worships. We don't. We don't see anything. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 5, the Bible says, all the priests, all the singers, all the musicians were one. Every one of them, the singers, the musicians, the choir conductor, all were one. And they made one voice unto God. Today, you find that all our singers, all our musicians are distracted. There's no unity among them. There's no one voice. Why? Because our minds fly everywhere. It's like a monkey that jumps from tree to tree. You know, there is a proverb in the Indian language, the mind is a monkey, which is very true. It jumps from tree to tree, right? When you sit in prayer, now, you all will say a big amen to the next statement that I'm going to say. The moment you sit in prayer, suddenly you remember everything under the sun. Right? All other times, you forget. And you're trying so hard to remember. Even your smartphone fails. But when you read the Bible, suddenly you remember, oh, that's where it is. Oh, I need to do this. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. See, the mind is a monkey. <laughs> suddenly it remembers where it has kept what. Now you need to pull the monkey. Bind the monkey. You know, many, about 20 years ago, in one of my travels in Tibet, I saw an American man flying a kite in the desert in, in Tibet. So I just stopped and just watched him flying the kite because I flew a kite when I was a small boy. And I was watching the man flying the kite. It was a huge, big kite that he brought all the way from the US to fly in Tibet. <laughs> so as I was watching him, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, what are you doing here? So I, I said, sir, I'm seeing this man flying a kite. Then the Holy Spirit told me, See, look at the height of the kite. How high it's flying. And how more height fl can it fly? So I said, that depends on the length of the string that this man is holding in his hand. Is that a good answer? Yes. yes. So then the Holy Spirit asked me, if a sudden gust of wind comes and it blows the kite away and it wants to fly everywhere, what will this man do? I said, sir, this man will hold his string very tight so that the kite doesn't fly away. Okay, good answer. Very good answer. Now he wants the kite to come down. What will he do? I said, he will just roll the string in his drum so that the kite will come down. But then the Holy Spirit told me, your mind is like the kite that flies everywhere. And the string is your self-control, your discipline, that you need to bring it under subjection so that you control your mind. It doesn't fly here and there. See, you bring your thoughts you bring your mind under subjection to the Holy Ghost so that it is always under control. No one can say, you know, I can do this, I can do that. My mind, I just can't concentrate. It's not that you cannot concentrate. You don't want to concentrate. You like those thoughts of...